Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and you have found Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. My guest today is Manoush Zamarodi. Manoush is the host of Note to Self on, uh, that's produced by WNYC Studios. Yep. And she just launched a new project called The Privacy Paradox. We're going to talk about privacy. We're going to talk about media. We're going to talk about the government. We're going to talk about maybe even the Supreme Court a little bit. Yes, and your phone. And your phone and what it knows about you and what you should really know about what your phone knows about you. Yes. Um, Manoush and I have been friends for a very long time. We should so tell everybody I, that, yeah. If, we should just disclose that <laughs> right at the top of the show. Okay. Um, if you're listening to I us feel on, better now that we've told them. It's, just, it's better to disclose. Okay. It's better yeah. to disclose. We know each um, other. If you're watching this on Facebook, you can ask us questions in the comments section. Social Pete will read them out to us uh, periodically so we can answer some of your questions. Social Pete. And like if you're that. listening to this later on, uh, we're on iTunes, we're on YouTube. Uh, we're on every podcast network, so you can listen to us there as well. So you many will, places, Dan. Yeah, it's many, many. All the places. All the places. Uh, if you're listening on one of those other platforms, of course, you will not be able to ask us a question because we are not live. Right. I'm glad you told people that. It's important. That it's important. Know. Again, the spirit of disclosure. Right. <laughs> let's talk about, before we get into yeah. the privacy paradox mm -hmm. itself, uh, let's talk about what you do. Because you are a radio personality. Yep. You've got a podcast, so it goes out on a podcast as well. You can yep. listen to it online. But then you do these experiments, <laughs> yes. which are not really, they're not what people might expect. No, so they're a little weird. Explain this process of these experiments, these engagements. Okay, so this is the third year that we're doing it. And the last two Januaries, what we've done is we've sort of taken a concept and we've asked people, join us for one week, try a behavior change, and see what happens. So for the first one, it was called Bored and Brilliant. We had 20,000 people sign up and sort of rethink how they use their phone. We asked them to put their phone down a little bit to try and get bored, because I went down this rabbit hole where I was like, wait, what happens when we get bored? And actually, I don't think I ever get bored anymore because I have my phone. So we asked people to purposefully make time to get bored for a week to see if it would jumpstart their creativity. And it actually worked. And Dan, like my favorite comments were the teenagers who were like, you know, I don't think I've ever had this sensation before. Because if you think about it, they've had yeah. phones their whole lives. They don't know what being bored is actually. They've never stood in a line <laughs> and not exactly. been able to talk to their friends. Right, without anything to do had to space out. They've never had to let their minds wander. So we did that for a week. Um, it was great. People were really into it. There's actually a book coming out in, uh, in September. That was bored and brilliant. And then last year we did something called Infomagical. And again, it was a week of every day, a different challenge. And what we were trying to do was help people deal with their information overload. This idea that I certainly had every night of just mindlessly scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And I was wondering, how much of this information do I actually retain in my brain? So we talked again to neuroscientists, uh, cognitive psychologists, technologists about what the brain can do, how we can use our technology to help us, to enhance our lives rather than like, make us feel like drooling idiots at the end of the day. Um, and that was great. That was 40,000 people again for a week. We made all these behavior changes, and 70% of them said that they felt they were able to handle information overload better than before. And, of course, you know, this was last January. It feels like a million years ago because we weren't even talking about echo chambers and filter bubbles mm, and alternative facts and all of those things. So I feel like we need to reprise that one. Yeah. Um, and then here we are again, it's January. And uh, I mean, it, it feels like so long ago when I really started thinking about this one, the privacy paradox, which is more about our digital civil liberty liberties, which actually ended up being incredibly timely, but not in the way I had expected it to yeah. be. I, I sort of thought this was like a post-Ed Snowden thing. Right. Um, I also really wanted to talk, and we could talk about this, this idea of the ad-based economy, the surveillance economy, as some of the experts I spoke to described it to me. Um, but it's been a weird couple weeks, and so I feel like people feel a little like, ah, what do I, I can't walk away from breaking news. But actually, I really think what we're finding are, is that people want to sign up for this week of challenges, which is next week, because it's simple, easy, constructive mm -hmm. things that they can try every day, and um, you can actually do something. So you've got the expert sources, yes. traditional, a lot of very traditional reporting, and then yes. you've got all these people walking through on a day-to-day -day basis doing these experiments and giving you feedback. Giving us feedback. And that That's feedback the key. then gets wrapped into your story, yes, too. Exactly. So you've got real people that are living it in real time. That's going to happen next week, but yes. if somebody misses that first day or two, 
it's fine. They'll the still way, be able to catch up. Exactly. So what we have it is that you can do Infomagical, for example, like today, you could sign up for it. It triggers. I mean, ideally, you do it with, you know, you wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, wow, tens of thousands of other people are waking up right now and we're all going to do this weird thing today. Mm -hmm. And there's a sort of collective community element to it in addition to the on-demand element to it. So right. we're trying to get the best of both worlds. And what was a real surprise to me with these projects is that at the end, we have had so many um, clinical researchers come to us and say, uh, can you share your data with us? Because we think it might help us figure out what we need to be studying as we go forward. And I'm like, yeah, our data is semi-scientific. It is not, you know, right. we don't have a control group. We're not doing it, certainly not in a lab like this one. Mm -hmm. But they are really, I think, looking to people, boots on the ground, of how technology is changing us as human beings and where they need to be going in terms of the actual published research going forward. So the privacy paradox a phrase that you know, I know what it means. Yeah, I, I used to you? intuitively know what it means. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard that phrase before, but it seems to be, it perfectly encapsulates what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, well, I, I'd heard the phrase and then I sort of dug into it. And so this is a phrase, the privacy paradox, that behavioral economists use. Um, specifically at Carnegie Mellon, they like to throw this one around. They, they're, they're claiming they ownership? They're allowed to. And the idea is that, like, actually, you know, no matter what you hear about millennials, you know, telling the most intimate things on Instagram, it's actually not true. Americans value their privacy immensely. 74% of Americans, this is according to Pew Research, say that it is extremely important to them that they control who has ownership of their personal information and data. And then what happens, though, every day, you know how it is. Then they, they give keep, it away. They give it away, exactly. So the question is, if we care so much about it, why are we giving it away? And, you know, it's really not the consumer's fault. It is, you cannot be a person in the world in 2017 and not be on these platforms. For example, one woman was like, she, a listener emailed me, was like, well, I, I, I'm going back to work. I was a stay-at-home mom. I need to be relevant. I need to be searchable. I used to be really protective of my privacy, and I can't be because I need to get a job. So how do I balance these two things, which is providing for my family, but also like a fundamental belief that I, I shouldn't have to reveal too much? So let's touch on this idea of that, that surveillance economy, Yes. which is that when you break it down and you get into this um, in, on the show, that so much of our digital lives are powered by personal information. Yes. It's powered by data, but not just any data, it's your private information. It drives Google, yep. it drives Facebook, it drives every media site that's out there, including PCMag.com. Yeah. Like, that's part of the advertising model. It's why we can create free content, it's why Facebook can create a free service, it's why we have this great free search engine that indexes the entire world. Um, why do you want to mess with them? Well, you know, I will say, like, what I found interesting, I didn't quite understand. So Shoshana Zuboff, I'm, like, name-dropping all kinds mm -hmm, of people nice. for you today, Dan. Um, she is a retired Harvard researcher. She's, like, at the nexus of this and, like, coined that term, term surveillance economy. And what I, you know, it's one thing if you're like, okay, here's my social security number. That's obvious. That's personal information. But she really talks about the digital exhaust that each of us have or digital breadcrumbs. So, you know, it's not the data per se, but it's the metadata. It's not the phone call I made, but what time I made the phone call, where I was when I made the phone call. That it's our behavior that actually is being used, and we don't have control over that. So... I'm perfectly fine with giving, you know, we make that trade off every day, right? The, the privacy calculus, which is like, fine, I will give you all my personal information as long as you give me a great product, a free product, a very personalized product, and all of us are going to, you know, I might be more vigilant about that than somebody else. Mm. But at least I should know what you're using my information for, and at least I should have the option of deciding to take it back, which I can't. Like once it's out there, that's it. You're, you, Facebook has it forever. So as you surveyed the landscape, did you find that that there are privacy controls? Like there are privacy controls in Facebook. Most people don't know how to use them. Yeah. Is it that there are controls that are out there and people aren't using them, or is it that ultimately you don't have a lot of control? And whether Facebook or Amazon or Apple or Microsoft have all this information about you? Well, I mean, there's one study that says it would take us 22 days a year to read all the terms of service that we it, for every website that we go on. So, like, don't bother reading them. There's no point. The legalese is perfectly written in 
incomprehensible ways. Exactly, yeah. to make no sense whatsoever. But also I think it's, we don't, how can we agree to things that we don't know are happening? So for example, uh, our friends at ProPublica did a great um, investigative research that found that Facebook has over 52,000 categories which that they put their users in. So a category, one was um, breastfeeding in public, mm. another was pretending to text awkwardly, another one was grass, and I'm not sure if that was this kind or like walk with your sh shoes yeah. off kind. I'm really not sure. All you know, in addition to, of course, your income, your what gender you say you, you know, all of those things that you tell them. It also watches wherever else you are and then puts you in all these different categories, which is fine. And you're like, oh, it's just advertising. But there's some weird categories also, like ethnic affinity. Mm -hmm. So they could say Dan Costa has a Asian American ethnic affinity. Which is kind of weird. So they would show you things that they, they think you don't, like. Don't think, judge me. Well, I'm not going to. Absolutely. This is a judge free space. Let's get a question in from, good, the, good point. from the audience. How concerned should we be about always listening voice assistants like Alexa? I'm freaked out by Alexa. Do you have an Alexa? I absolutely do not have an Alexa. Really? No there, way. She's amazing. She makes your life better. This is good. This is a deb debate. Tell me about how great Alexa is. Alexa First of all, like I don't want some woman that I'm bossing around in my house, like not setting a good. Again, I feel a little judgment. <laughs> the uh, so I, I mean, it's hard to describe what she does when you bring her home, but just that that voice based interface to yeah. be able to ask for things and have her deliver them. It's the same. You ask the same questions you would ask for if you're typing on your phone or if you're at your keyboard, but being able to do it hands free is very liberating. Here's my problem, okay? Just last month, law enforcement asked Amazon to hand over the recordings that Alexa had made in the home of an alleged murderer. Now, mm -hmm. no judgment on the mur alleged murderer, yeah. of course. But we're at a point where there are no legal protections for any of this case. stuff. It is a fascinating case. And it, it wasn't necessarily that, that Alexa would have recordings of everything that happened in the house. Right. But if he had been asking for things like... Paper towels, where can maybe? I buy, where can I buy black... <laughs> Black plastic bags <laughs> and, um, and gloves and, and latex gloves and, and we th those laugh. types of it's searches terrible. would mm. be in the, the hits. And if he committed to him, uh, if he did it on a desktop, those searches would also be findable and, and, and observable. I mean, we're at this point, though, Dan. I think to me, the point is like there's no law, there's nothing, there's no regulation. Nobody has any say. We also don't even like another one that I was reading about was have you heard about? We're doing. Should I give it away? I think you should. Okay, it's a tool we're going to ask people to try next week. It's called Apply Magic Sauce. Mm -hmm. what, do you know this one? I do not. Oh my god, it's unbelievable. So you, it will look at your Facebook profile and it will predict your personality. And so there's actually a great piece in Motherboard today um, written by these German reporters saying that was technology similar to Apply Magic Sauce from Cambridge Analytica used maybe mm -hmm. to see what people's personalities were on Facebook? So it looks at your Facebook profile. I mean, you no. figure it could do a bunch of things like, you know, are you using curse words? Are you writing about certain products? Are you What's your punctuation? How do you construct sentences? What words do you use? It called me... Um, 94% more hardworking and organized than the rest of the population. Not 93%, 94, based on that, something I had written. Did you find that accurate? Do you think that's an accurate assessment? Well, that's the question, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's accurate, or is that my, ex you know, to get like deep into like psychoanalysis, or is that my externalization of my personality? Like, is that okay that they're not reading what I write, but they're literally reading between the lines and then showing me things based on that? But they don't tell me that in the privacy settings. We don't know if that's being I think, used. I think that's a really interesting point because there's obviously a lot of anxiety. People are very, there's people who are weirded out by this yes, technology. Yes, creepy. And they because they're, they're just trying to wrap their heads around it. Um, but I mean, if you if you take it and you go to the flip side and you go, well, what does it really matter? Right. Like, what is at stake here? Um, what are you afraid of happening? What are you afraid of? Uh, being put into one of these buckets, like what's the worst thing that happens? Right, well, I put that exact question to this great guy, Joseph Turo, he's at the University of Pennsylvania. He has studied marketing for decades. And his whole thing is, you are rehearsing right now to not have any privacy in your life at all. And the Fourth Amendment, baby, the word privacy is not used, but it is what makes us Americans. This right to have 
self-determination, autonomy, free will. I mean, I feel like we're at a point where we kind of have to go back to basics. What did we see at the airport over the weekend? We saw customs officials asking people to hand over their phones to show them their Twitter accounts before they entered this country. So I, I customs think... Customs has been using social media profiles for a while. Have they? Domestically. Oh, I and, didn't know that. Yeah. When they call up the... When they're, that guy's sitting behind the desk yeah. and he calls up your information, it has... If you have a public, a public account, it has that information up there. So who gets to decide what I've written is un, unacceptable, quote? I think, I think the thing that what your show is doing, what we've been talking about a lot of about is that individuals need to be aware what they put out there yeah. is not going to stay in one place. No. And if it's public and it's online, it's going to be searchable and it's going to be analyzable. Yes. With and, and not just one at a time, but in mass. And so Professor Churro said to me, he's like, I mean, at the very least, we need to go from creepy to crappy. Because if it's crappy, at least we understand it and maybe we can try to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Creepy, we just don't even understand how it works. And that doesn't seem... Like, we're using these things all day long. We should have a little bit more knowledge as to how they work and where our personal information and you is get going. Into the, you get into that in the show. You reveal how a lot of these things yes, work. Yes, exactly. Um, let's get in, uh, another question in from the okay. audience. Well, we just learned to accept <clears throat> future millennial politicians having unseemly things coming back from their distant digital pasts. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, if Access Hollywood, I mean, does it matter? Like we saw, you can dig up the files and it doesn't seem that, to matter. But that was a public figure. Yes. Trump was a public figure and he was getting ready for a media hit and he knew there were cameras and microphones on the bus. Um, the larger question is that there's a whole generation that's had cameras on them since they were 10 years old. It's amazing. And digital wow. photos don't go anywhere. No. And they're in these vast Google Photos libraries and uploaded in the, in the cloud. And you can see people that have college photos. Like there are no pictures of me from college. Like, no, me neither. Like, Thank God. They, 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 would, they would have to be filmed Unless photos. Somebody's going to find some right now. But, and, um, but now, now, anybody in the last 10 years, there are pictures of them from college at every moment. And that's going to stay with them forever. I mean, and maybe we are going to get used to that. I mean, that's what's so interesting to me is that things that we have taken for granted for millennia, like boredom, for example, now these are things that we have to name and introduce to a generation that will not have experienced it so for like the European right to be forgotten, mm -hmm. like forgetting. Remembering used to be like, you know what I mean. Forgetting used to be a human thing, but now we have to like have a European Union ruling, and tech companies have to comply to like it. Just used to be part of the human experience. So it's interesting to me. We're learning which of those things. Like okay, it's fine if it's gone, and other ones are like, oh crap. <laughs> like that kind of really messes with society when there's no forgetting anything. I'm not. Yeah, this I is don't, a Black Mirror episode. Yeah. Well, we're in it. This is and uh, it, and so let's say somebody doesn't want to accept these terms. Yeah. You want to reject the terms and conditions of Facebook, of mm -hmm. Apple, of carrying a smartphone everywhere. What recourse do consumers have? Is it either in or out? I don't think it is at all. And and I think that's unreasonable to ask. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I use Google Docs. Like I, you have to function. So we want to ask people. Decide for yourself, you know, so you don't feel icky all day, you know, that feeling when you're like, ah, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. Don't feel icky. At the, actually, I'm going to reveal this, at the, at the end of the project, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the um, inventor of the World Wide Web, actually sits down with us and writes a personal terms of service. So just sort of codify what you're okay with. For himself. Yeah. Like, this he, is what he's okay this with. This is what this he's, is okay, what he's okay, with. okay with. And then I, we have made a fill in the blank like Mad Libs mm -hmm. for everyone to do. So it's not like, uh, wait, is this one okay and this one's not? No. Just like you'll have it with you. Maybe, I don't know, print it out, use it as your screensaver. Like privacy is blank to, you know, what, and, and I'm, there's no, no judgment. Mm -hmm. For some people, I think it'll be like, oh, I am out. There will be people, and my listeners have told me that, and other people are like, you know what, I'm okay with this company, maybe Apple, because they do have take a stand on privacy, but I'm not okay with maybe, I don't want to name names, you know, well, other folks. You should name, uh, what's, what are your personal limits? So you carry a cell phone, but but the Alexa, you have no interest in having an, an no. Alexa at mm -mm. home. Um, so we got a Nest, and I regret it. Okay. Oh, there's just because of the privacy issues or because... It just hasn't been working. <laughs> Both. <laughs> we've had some problems. <laughs> well, we, so we have, when you sign up for the Privacy Paradox, we've actually recreated a quiz. 
There's this dude, Alan Weston, he is the man sociologist when it comes to like people's feelings about privacy. So we have taken his very scientific work and turned it into a fun quiz because that's what we do. I'm dying to know what you are. So you take the quiz and it tells you whether you are a believer, a realist, or a shrugger. I'm a realist. You're a realist. For sure. I'm definitely a realist too. I mean, I will every time I get I download an app and I, and I look yeah. at the permissions, I look at them and I decide like, is there any reason this app needs my GPS? Yes. Does it need access to my microphone? Right. Like, what does it have access to the hard drive? Like, and I will make a decision. And there are plenty yeah. of apps. I just if it's just a junky app yep. that doesn't add any value to my life, see ya. I just pass by it. Yep. Yep. So that's I mean, keeping in mind you're the executive editor of PC Mag. Totally. Okay. Normal, everyday people should be able to do that. Like, we had an event last night, and we asked people to do that. Like, look at your apps. If, like, there's an app that's asking you for access to your microphone, but they don't have anything to do with voice, why should they have it? Turn it off. And then people are like, oh, you know? Yeah. like then, I'll tell you, app developers, the default is yeah. to get access to everything. Of course. Because they may want to feature later on, and they want, they want to grow into the app. But their default, they assume most people will just click through, and, and they do. Right, right. At, and that makes sense to me. They want as much information as possible. But Sir Tim Berners-Lee, is have you heard about this? So he's working I've heard on? of him, yes. No, no, what he's working on. No. These personal um, data storage, they're pods, this, like, basically flipping what the web is. So the idea would be, like, instead of you logging into Facebook, Facebook would log into you. Mm-hmm. And you would grant them whatever information you felt okay with. You would also be able to take it back whenever you wanted. And that way you have you literally have your terms of service. Exactly. And Facebook needs to comply with your terms of service. Exactly. Instead of you having to comply with theirs. Right. And if they don't want to comply on your terms, then they can't access your personal information. Precisely. So, so it's a project at MIT. It's called Solid. He is looking for developers to help him. Um, and, you know, I, at first I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy town. But then you're like, well... This guy invented the web. He so did it once. Anyone can do it again. He did it once. I wouldn't bet against him. No. We got another uh, question from okay. the audience. Should I trust Windows 10? <laughs> what do you think, Dan? I think you can trust Windows 10 as much as you trust any operating system. Um, Microsoft itself, I don't think it's done anything inherently um, untrustworthy. Mm-hmm. And um, when it comes to privacy concerns, mm-hmm. I think there's so much other stuff going on. I think. And I, there's Google's whole platform, but I, the thing that worries me is um, all the advertisers. Uh-huh. These third parties and companies that are tracking and then reselling your data, yes. and that's where there's not a lot of regulation. No. Um, and that's not, a, that's not a Microsoft thing. It's not a Google thing. It's this third-party market yes. that operates completely under everybody's radar. Which, I mean, goes back decades, right, in this country to junk mail, to people selling and swapping. I didn't know this, but ProPublica, Julia Angwin, the investigative reporter, was telling me that actually Facebook is the biggest purchaser of of these, like, the six big data mm-hmm. firms that they spend the most money not only taking the information you put into Facebook as a user, but then also purchasing information about you from the big data collection companies. And the, and the matching that goes on yes. in that back room where yes. even if you give Facebook, a, you know, you lock everything down at Facebook, you're on the service, but all they really know is your email address. Yeah. They will then take that email address and match it to a cookie, mm-hmm. match it to your credit report, because mm-hmm. all the credit report agencies, right. they distribute all this information as well. So there's this va- this huge network of databases back there. You don't even have to give your information to Facebook. They can get it elsewhere. I mean, I don't do Facebook as a normal person. Will you? Can I just say, Dan and I... This is an old argument. This is an old argument. Dragging out in front of the camera. I kind of love it. Because when Facebook, like, what was that, like 10 years ago? Yeah, when they let old folks on. Yeah, when they let old people on, you were like, you got to do it. I was like, no way. I I said you had to do it for your career. You did. And I was like, I don't like the idea of all my identities being smushed into one, like, nothingness. And you were like, welcome to the new online world. And I was like, no, I'm not doing it. So I, I mean, I, I'm sure I've suffered the consequences. That's I on your like, Facebook page today. There's it's pretty crappy. There. There's something, but I'm not, like, I don't have any friends. I'm kind of okay with it. <laughs> you have real life friends. <laughs> I have real life friends like you, Dan. You have real life Can friends. we answer the Windows question? I feel like we I think I said go ahead and download <laughs> Windows 10. You can trust Windows 10 a lot more than Windows 7 or Windows oh. 8. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. And, and patch your software, people. For pizza. Yes, my God. Even definitely, I know that. Definitely patch your software. Patch so that software. We've talked about uh, my big concerns around the sort of the private sector. Yes. Spying, snooping, reselling your, your personal information. Yeah. But there's a flip side, too, which is that all this information can also be used by the government. Yes. And that is something 
that's I think we need to be more and more concerned about. I these mean, things. it is fascinating to me. So another person I spoke to, uh, Laura Donahue, she's at um, Georgetown University. She's a Fourth Amendment legal expert, and I was like, so when did they think that it was okay to take all of our information? And she said, oh, they looked to the companies. They were like, well, if all the companies can have all this yeah. information, why Experian can't we? Experian has this information. Yeah. Why should we not have totally. this information? Uh, UK new investigative powers, they are holding on to everyone's search terms for a year. Just sitting there, no matter what you've searched for. Everybody. If they were, but they had, I mean, it's only for a year. So that almost totally. had to be legislated in. Yeah. Because if it, if it right. wasn't legislated, then they'd be there forever. Just keep it there. So you Just search for case. something when you're 21, that search record exists when you're 41 right. or 61. And, you know, I think really to the other paradox to me is like, there are bad people who can be stopped with these techniques. This horrible, like, pedophile ring that they ended up using. The FBI went online and infiltrated this. Of course, that is the truth. But they didn't get a warrant. There's no, there's no legal protections for the other people. So for every one great thing that happens, what is happening to the rest of our civil liberties? And at what point do we draw the line? I mean, I think this is like the bigger question. I think, you know, with the Supreme Court, obviously back in the news today, um, this is going to be the next big question. We know that they can't search our phones, but what, can, what else, you know? That, that's, they're going to have to decide. They can make you unlock your phone with a fingerprint. With a fingerprint, but, but not with the But if you have the passcode, the thing, so then weird. you're safe. Why is that? Um, because it's, uh, they can fingerprint you. Your right. fingerprint is, not, is something that they can legally get from you when right. they take you into custody. But getting information from you all of a sudden becomes incriminating yourself, and therefore that's why you should always have a passcode, even if you use your even if you fingerprint use that. Right. Your phone. Yeah. Third party doctrine. We tell the story. It's a very sexist story, actually. Mm -hmm. Third party doctrine. 1979 Supreme Court ruling that said the minute you make a phone call, you are handing over your personal information to the phone company, but not the contents of what you say on the phone. But here we are. We're handing over. Yes, we have accounts with Gmail. But what about all the emails that we're writing? Is that similar? Is that content? And when is you that, write them, and, and when you what write your them? grammar was like, and what your grammar and was like, and what words you used, and all that gets fed right. back into the database. And whether you even sent it or it just sat there as a draft. So have you gotten any? Have, uh, did you? So you've recorded most of this, sh most of these shows. Yeah, we're put, we're finishing it. Did up. you get any takeaways that were like, wow, I didn't know, I, I didn't know I could do this with that tool, or I didn't know I could protect myself that way? Like what can what takeaways did you have that like you're like oh I'm gonna do this differently going forward? Well, I didn't know about digital fingerprinting. Like, does that seem really mm -hmm. lame that you that I didn't know that? No, I, I don't think most people do. I so we're asking people to try um, a tool from EFF Electronic Frontier Foundation um, called Panopticlick. This is on day two. And that was, I was like, I have got all the blockers on. I'm going to get a clean bill of health. You just literally, you click a button that says test me, and it tells you what is tracking you where. I had all the ad blockers on. I, I wasn't being followed by cookies. But the digital fingerprinting was going on. And for those of you who don't know digital fingerprinting, it's literally what version of the browser are you on? What font do you use? What kind of computer are you on? How often do you get online at a certain time? And it combines all these teeny tiny data points to figure out who you are, even if you've opted out or you're incognito or whatever else. I didn't know that was possible. So now I have Privacy Badger. Do you use Privacy Badger? Um, I've got, I turn everything on and off at one point or another. You do? I systematically have to just purge it all because yes. I can't keep track of all the things that are right. running. Right, right. So, for me, ghostry is another one. I mean, you, you can't do it all, right? But if we give up at the risk of sounding like Joan of Arc or something, if we give up, like, it's not okay, especially, I think, with what we've seen uh, be called into question yeah. over the last couple of weeks. At the same time, if everybody starts using Privacy Badger, Ghostery, and Adblock Plus, the free web goes away. Like, we are no longer being right. able to put out content for free because the ad model breaks down. That's correct. And it's sort of a little shaky right now. It is. I would pay for these things. I am look. Can you help me? I am looking for a great email provider that is private, that will let me download my, take out my emails, and that you're going to mock me for. You know, you don't run a tell them. email server. Because what could go wrong with that? Right, exactly. I mean, so, like, I'm, the, Gmail's probably the safest place for your email, except, oh, yeah, Google has all. Like, do you know what I, mm -hmm. Is there anywhere? I don't... 
I mean, you can go with a smaller you can go with a smaller company and get less services. Right. Email's pretty basic. There's a lot of different places you can get it, but also then you get into the thing where you do most of your email at work anyway. So you're trusting WNY. And the minute you email C. someone who has an account anywhere else, then you've lost the game anyway. But I would pay for that. I would pay for a Facebook that didn't do all those things. I mean, that's not fair to people who can't afford to pay for it. There have been projects to start it, but you just can't get enough. Right. You can't get enough people on it in order right. to make it sustainable. I mean, I will say the New York Times is actually showing that people will pay for news. They'll pay the New York Times for news. Right. I think we'll have a different conversation if we try and get them to pay for PCMag.com. Do you? Um, we've talked about it, but I just yeah. don't think for what we do, there's so many other people doing reviews. Yeah. There are going to be a lot less reporters making money on the web okay. because of these trends. All right, so let's say that one won't work. What about, here's one, another one that I'm really into, another idea, because we're going to float a lot of these next week. What about a Hippocratic Oath for developers? Like ethical, doctors have it, lawyers have it, journalists even have it. Mm -hmm. Why not people who make the technology? It would be for the developers or for, I mean, because basically you're talking about ad technology, tracking technology. Mm, but the people who make the tools, mm -hmm. that they will, you know, just maybe people won't actually stick to it, but at least there's something. You know, this was something you were talking to, uh, Neil Dash was at the yes, panel. Yes. Did he bring this up? I'm, yeah. Because this is a big thing that he's talked about, which is that all these technologies that were birthed in Silicon Valley, yeah. amazing tools that have changed the world, uh, there's very little consideration as to the ethics involved in doing this. And, I mean, Google, to its credit, said, look, we're not, don't, do, don't be evil. In its mission don't statement, say it anymore, though. but it's that, you know that was very broad, yeah. it's specifically in the day-to-day -day life of engineers. I don't think that there are a lot of developers or coders that are thinking about what are the impact of what's the impact of this tool going to be yeah. once I let it loose into the world. We have heard from some of our listeners because um, we do have a bunch of techies who are fans of the show, and they. Uh, you know, I've had people write in and say, I am trying to start this conversation on the ground at my organization, that it's something that just becomes part of the process. And Anil was saying how, like, there's no CS program out there that has ethics as part of the discussion. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. A great I mean, point. at least let's talk about it, you know? The, Privacy requires a public conversation. Another paradox. So we're having that conversation right now. <laughs> yes, we are. We're, we're educating people. We've talked about a few tools that yeah. they can use um, in terms of keeping their information private. Um, but there's also an upside mm. to this data revolution, these huge data sets, and you've covered sure. that on your show as well. Yeah. In terms of, you know, we can solve, we've got really big data, and that big data can be used to solve really big problems. Yes. And we shouldn't lose sight of that. Yes, absolutely. I got another treat and got to go to MIT and dork out. Um, I went to visit Sandy Pentland's lab. He is one of the people that's doing um, social big data change. So looking at cities, um, all kinds of data. Where is, does the sunlight land? Where are people tweeting from? Which corner has the most investment dollars? And then his idea is to get all the stakeholders of a city around the table and look at what they can know. Uh, for example, in Germany, he tested it out with um, a mayor. They were getting several thousand Syrian refugees. And the question was, how can we make sure that those refugees aren't ghettoized? Mm -hmm. How can we integrate them into the city? How can we get all the stakeholders, you know, the Department of Commerce, the housing people, the refugee people, uh, the healthcare workers, and really make this work. Uh, that's really exciting mm -hmm. that they can look at the data and try to make our cities more healthy, make people live together in harmony. That's wonderful. But then, of course, he's like, but on the other hand, if you gave the data to a dictator who didn't invite any of the stakeholders, they would be able to use it to completely ruin people's lives and make sure that there was no health services in a certain, went to a certain neighborhood or there was no law enforcement in a certain neighborhood. Or maybe they'd be like, oh, all the poor people live there. Let's send a lot of law enforcement there. So it, it really, you know, and techies love to say this, the technology itself is not... Mm -hmm. To blame, it is neutral, it is the people who use it, and we are dependent on that. There's also been a lot of stories about how technology and those data sets were used in the last election cycle, mm -hmm. perhaps better by uh, the Republicans than the Democrats, and that may right. have given them an advantage, and it's, that's, that information was all out there. Right. So it's something that technology can be used for good or for evil. Yeah, which is kind of terrifying, so, actually. So what terrifies you the most? I ask everybody what they, what they are most afraid of in the, when it comes to technology in the future. Mm. What is keeping you up at night? You know, it's this quote from this uh, philosopher at the Oxford Internet, Internet Institute. He was called, he 
was called on by Google to advise them. I mean, I love the fact that Google had an in-house philosopher. That's sure. cool. And he just said to me, why is privacy important? Because a life without shadow is a flat life. And the thought of us n not being able to find space mentally to think through problems, to come to ideas without fear of judgment or or that we, you know, we opine so quickly now, and, and a lot of these issues are extremely complicated, and they take time and conversation, and, and they take privacy and solitude, and that worries me. This, you know, I have kids. I want them to be able to sit and figure something out before they have to tell someone about it, mm -hmm. or they get shot down, or that they have to seek validation for it. Um, joyfulness. I want us to live in a place where we care for each other, and there's decent, and there's a there's kindness in the world. Is that like weird and Oprah? -esque? I don't think it's. I don't think it's too bad. Um, on the flip side, I'm over of, forty, Dan. This is what happens when you know. Start talking about the kids. <laughs> in terms of the, of the positive things, things that excite you the most. Yeah. Um, that either you use in your daily life or that you're just super excited about it happening. Uh, what are you really optimistic about? I mean, I that I worry about this. That people are like, oh, she's anti-technology. Oh my God, no! Mm -hmm. I love my phone. Like the. Um, the artistic ability that we have, like my son is like starting to make comic books online. Like we can do so many cool, cool, wonderful things. I love, um, I mean, again, my producer and I, we will, you know, FaceTime and work on Google Docs and use every known capability so that we can be home with our kids for dinner. You know, like it has made it possible for me to be a working mother and, and truly have a big career and also tuck my kids into bed at night and like that that's amazing mm -hmm. i that's an amazing thing that it has given me i'm not sure i would have been able to do that 10 years ago i told you it was gonna help you out you did say i, told I know you it was gonna be great. always listen to so Dan. tell uh, tell the audience how they can participate um next week or really at any time to yeah, join the project yeah. come join us it's, it's gonna be fun it's gonna be intense i think too uh privacyparadox.org is the place to go. What will happen is you will be asked for your email. We will not share it with anyone. We even have our own privacy statement, but it is in plain English, uh, very simple. No cookies on there either, by the way. And then what happens is you will trigger a newsletter, which has, uh, you can get as much or as little background to the technology, the science as you want. And we'll also give you tips and things that you can try. Like, so Monday, again, it's Bruce Schneier, cryptographer. He's awesome. We have, um, we have a little thing that we want everyone to get on. We want everyone to try Signal. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've covered Signal many times. It's, it, it's good stuff. And yeah, we've given it a great review. Right? Yeah. So we have a note to self Signal number, and we're going to create a group on Signal. So I think that's fantastic. I know, it's great, right? I think it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's going to be good. And I, and I think that what we want to do is, and what we've seen happen is, like, change can actually happen if we all do this together and support each other. And we're not saying you have to be like, turn, you know, throw away your phone. What we're saying is just try different things. There are alternatives. There are ways of modifying the technology so that it feels like it aligns with your values and beliefs. Well, you've sold me. I'm going to participate. Woo! I'll be on there next week. I'll be tweeting about it. Awesome. Um, people can find you on Twitter. Yeah, at Manoush Z. Very cool. That is Fast Forward for today. I want to thank you for joining us. If you have made it this far into the program, you probably <laughs> like what you heard. Do me a favor, get on iTunes, get on Stitcher, and give us a rating and a review. That'll help us uh, reach more people. So true. Dan's the best. Really you want to hang it. out with him every week. We're going to be back next week with a brand new interview. Thanks for joining us.